All right, Rob. So I'm glad we're connecting. Uh, thanks for coming on the podcast. It, it, am I your first podcast or no? Yes, you are oh. my third pot, my first podcast. You're a virgin podcaster. <laughs> Look at That's that. That's right. You uh, <laughs> may, you may get me addicted to do more. Nice. Yeah, it's it's. I do a lot of speaking on podcast guesting, like you know how you can promote what you do, and there's no cigar guys around. You're the only guy, so I would wow. think you get a lot of guest spots. Well, actually, you know, you spoke at one of my networking meetings on podcasting. Right. And developed our relationship past that. But my competitors actually have retail stores. Yeah. They've been in business a lot longer than I have, but they kind of wait for people to walk in the door. I'm, yeah, uh, they're retail. They're not active like you are. Now, didn't you used to do events like a J&R and things like that? When Well, I'm proud to say that I am J&R's uh, pr- um, you know, preferred cigar roller. Okay. Uh, I have done a couple of events there when they do their, uh, their Cuban nights. Nice. So I've been there and um, I'm, I'm uh, a preferred cigar roller in several other locations like Crystal Springs. Um, just got a call from up the Montclair Country Club. So that's, that's part of being out and about. All right. Well, we can talk all about cigars because I used to smoke a lot of cigars and my dad had double bypass surgery and I promised my mom I'd stop, but I still, I fall off the wagon every once in a while. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but let's go back to a little bit like where you grew up. I think you're originally from Brooklyn, you said, and yep. background uh, in business, because I know you haven't been doing this all your life. Uh, no, I grew up in Brooklyn, um, in an Italian-Irish neighborhood. It was a My, different neighborhood uh, in those days, right? Very true, yeah. very true, but yet close-knit, and uh, I have a lot of good memories of my childhood. Um, I worked for my father and grandfather at that time they were in the automotive aftermarket accessory business and uh, we did a lot of sales to new car dealers. I then in turn when I left them I went to work for a manufacturer of automotive aftermarket equipment and after working with car dealers uh, you do begin to develop a a tough skin. I'm sure. uh, yeah, it's, it's a not an business. easy clientele. Correct. Yeah, it's a business that needs some regulation. But aftermarket accessories, that's like if you change out the radio or you put Ex- exactly. uh, you know, body kits on, all that kind of stuff? Correct. Uh, remote starts, uh, additional speakers, uh, then graduated into uh, sunroofs, leather interior. Oh, like and people would have a sunroof and they would want one. So then you guys would put it in? Correct. Correct. But as time went on, uh, the manufacturer got smarter and yeah. pretty much ship cars in with all of those type of accessories. So it got very hard to really do any type of major business with that. Yeah, I remember in high school, you don't really do this now, but we used to like, we would get, I don't know, I had a little Subaru or some, or college, I should say, not high school. And we used to rip the radios out and we would go buy, you know, Harman Kardon or JBC or whatever it was in those ga- days. And we would put in new speakers, we would load the thing, and you could exactly. pull them out, right? Because people would steal them. You know, to take right. the, pull the whole thing out. Um, that's correct but, that's but it was good exactly sound right. we had yeah we had really good systems but i guess the newer systems in the cars are fine people don't care right they just want to well they don't play. care and you know so many cars are leased people don't want to invest that into a car right anymore. and then they lose it or right, right whatever yeah exactly. i remember we used to install remember the phones um we used to have the 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 uh you know you take those brick phones they would snap in so it could be on the speaker now it's all bluetooth right. Right, That's and then right. you, the equipment right. would be in your lease. You'd have to take it out, move it to the next, and then eventually got obsolete, and then now they don't even do that. You just get in your car. I knew exactly. that would happen eventually, yeah. Sure, they get smart. Yeah, it catches yeah. up. Okay, so so I guess that business is no longer around? Um, some people have a couple of retail stores. Uh, my family business, no. Okay. Um, unfortunately, when my mom, I already moved on. When my mom passed away, my father closed the store. So uh, okay. past that, after that great experience. Right. But you had and, good sales experience, right? I mean, that's oh, a hell of an industry to. Well, I worked uh, both sell. retail and wholesale for them. So that's how I developed, um, you know, my, my sales approach right. and, um, you know, retail, uh, when you're in front of a customer is a lot to do with personality as well. Sure. And so, um, you know, the old thing about listening to what somebody wants instead of what you actually want to sell them really comes in handy as far as that goes. Right, for sure. So, so okay. that was interesting. Okay. Um, time to time, I actually graduated into the uh, cell phone business. 
Okay. The manufacturer that I went to work for actually had uh, Toshiba making their car phones. Okay. And uh, that was a very good experience. And again, a lot of it went to uh, first went to car dealers. Yeah. But more importantly, that's when uh, retail car phone stores started to open up. So we had right. sales Independent there. stores. There's not as many around as used to be, right? Exactly. Well, yeah. um, once the carriers... Uh, perfected uh, retail stores that put all the little guys out. Yeah, I remember a lot of guys were in that business. They were you could go to them and get almost any carrier and the phones, and exactly. but you had to pay for the phones in those days. It was right; it was more expensive. Well, yeah, you paid you for money the phone. on the equipment, right? You made money on the equipment in those days. Exactly. Then, as time went on, the carriers were paying commissions for activations. So, in turn, that's when the phones you know, became free or pretty much close right, to because, free. But then you're building a stream of income, right? Because you get right. money each month from the bills. Right. Yeah, but you, I guess then, then they got, then that's what always happens, right? They're like, oh, you're making too much money. I'm going to force you out of the business. Exactly. Right. Well, you know, they keep, keep their statistics. They see where the retail stores are making the most money and then they put their own store right across the street. Right. And pop so, up, run them out of the business. Exactly. And yeah. then for a little while, uh, we were the largest um, it, reseller for WorldCom Wireless. And uh, yeah, we were either two or three in the country. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, when they filed for bankruptcy, they owed us like a million and a half dollars Ooh. and the company couldn't absorb the loss. Of course. So unfortunately, they had bought MCI, didn't they? Exactly. Yeah, I remember Exactly that. the right. case. Yeah. And, um, you know, so unfortunately that didn't work out. And then um, I stayed in the cell phone business for a little while and um, went in and out of working for other people. But I always thought that... Um, you know, if you're going to do a good job for, if you're going to do a good job, there's not that much of a difference between doing it for yourself or doing it for somebody else. Granted, right. you have the fi financial responsibility, but um, th that was the whole thing. And um, about 12 years ago, maybe 13 years ago, I started uh, wholesaling some cigars and I was also selling some cigars, working with some fundraisers um just on the side like a side gig like this. exactly yeah and then i came to a crossroad where i was putting in a lot of time into it and i really wasn't seeing much back out of it very fortunately i met met a master roller from a toro fuente and over oh, a 10 month sure. period of time on a part-time basis he taught me how to roll where i felt comfortable enough doing it in front of people and um so, so then, i i didn't realize that i know you plan these events but you actually do rolling yourself yeah, well, I before I learned how to roll, I used to factor it out to somebody else. Okay. And um, what ended up happening, I booked an event with him three months in advance, three weeks before the event, he canceled on me. And you're stuck so, now. Right. So at that point, I said to myself, I'm either going to figure, I'm either going to learn how to roll myself, or I'm going to stop offering it because it's not worth the bad press and the headaches. Right. So that's when I met this master roller. And um, I learned how to roll cigars. And then uh, my brother-in-law is my graphic designer. We do uh, custom labeling where we put individual names or corporate logos on cigar bands. And that's becoming more and more popular. In fact, during this pandemic, I've been doing a, a lot of it. Of uh, um, human and private labeling stuff? Yes, correct. Gifts you know, and things to people? It's weddings. It's, you know, right. bride's names, groom's name, the date. And then, you know, we can do corporate logos. Or sometimes when I do fundraisers, the fundraiser goes out, gets a sponsor to pay for me. And in turn, we put their logo on the cigar band. Yeah, that makes sense. So how, so if, if you're doing an event like that, you're the only guy rolling. How many cigars can you roll in, in an event? Well, put under pressure, I could probably roll about 30 an hour. But that's, okay. that's two minutes really, cigar. Yeah. That's pushing that, it, right? No, actually, if nobody's, if nobody's talking to me, I can probably roll a cigar a minute because the filler is actually made before I get there okay. uh, it has to be because it has to be put into a mold, has to be un put under pressure for 10, or 12, 10 or 20 hours for it to hold its shape. The only thing that holds that filler together is tobacco within tobacco and the pressure. So the filler is made before I get there. What I'm doing is what they call adding the final leaf or the outer leaf to the cigar. Oh, okay. So it's not like you're starting with a pile of uh, no. shavings and then you're putting them in a leaf and rolling it up. And yeah, no. it's- I'll leave, I'll leave with shavings, but I don't arrive right. with the shavings. <laughs> um, so uh, that's what I end up doing at the event. But normally what ends up happening, it's uh, probably about 10 
cigars an hour. Okay. And uh, yeah, because people are talking to you and they're interested and they're watching. <coughs> Bless you. Me. That's right. Uh, yeah, people are talking. Um, I come always come with pre-rolled cigars, which gives uh, me the opportunity to o- offer variety. Uh, normally, it's, oh, I see. Um, okay. Mild to mild to medium type of cigars. Um, and that way people have a choice. Someone who smokes a strong cigar uh, will smoke a mild or a mild to medium cigar. Someone who smokes a mild cigar will not smoke a strong cigar. They just Right, it's like it. coffee if you like, yeah, or tea, you know, yeah, people don't like strong stuff. Like the strong people will be fine with the mild stuff, but if they- Exactly, right, yeah, exactly. Exactly, yeah, you don't like spicy food, you're not gonna, right. If you like spicy food, you can deal without the spice. Right. Right. Or add. That's why they make condiments. So. Right. Absolutely. Exactly so, the case. so you had always been a cigar smoker. Like, is that how you? Got um, I I start. I've been smoking cigars for a very long time, and when it came to this opportunity, I was really in between jobs or bored in the job I was in, and I was really looking for something to do. And I've always enjoyed being in business for myself. Uh, no matter if I've been in business for myself or someone else, I've always created direct and indirect channels of distribution. Right. And as much as I do enjoy the cigars, um, you know, that's the way I kind of look at it is that, um, you know, I look for accounts. Um, I network. Um, you know, you look for referrals. Right. Cigars happen to be the product. And I'm happy to say that when people see me, uh, they're happy to see me compared to being in the yeah. cell phone business, I usually, uh, you know, you hear from somebody with a cell phone when they have a problem. You're right, usually. So so do you sell other, you rep brands of cigars that you sell to? Um, I don't retail? because with all the competition online, people don't need me for name brand product. I get, get my directly. product um, from boutique manufacturers. Plus I offer uh, a Leva product, which is Nicaraguan tobacco. And I work with the largest distributor in the world for that product. Now, do we have Cuban cigars here? Well, um, up until a little while ago, you were able to bring Cuban cigars into the country. Back. So if you were visiting Cuba, you could bring them with you. Well, you can bring it from anywhere. Three years ago, I brought some back from Mexico. Oh, so right, because they sell them there. Yeah. Right. Now, unfortunately, this administration just put something out where they're not allowing that to happen any longer. But the truth of the matter is, is that Cuban cigars before, after. Yeah, they now, get here, right. Millions of Cuban cigars are sold in this country every year. I'm sure. So um, You got a guy who knows a guy. I got a guy, he's got a guy. I used exactly. to have a guy. Right. Exactly, right. yeah. When exactly. I was in, uh, I guess really when I started playing golf, like in law school, mostly, maybe a little bit of college, that's when I started smoking cigars. Because right. you're on the golf course and somebody says, hey, you want a cigar? I'm like, yeah, okay. And then, I mean, I was into, I had a, you know, a humidor and my, not that big, but a, you know, a small humidor. I, I was, what was I? I was smoking a lot of um, Ashton's and, yes. yeah. and uh, remember the Gloria Cubanos? Yes. They were really, they're, are they still around? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So are the Ashton's. In fact, those lines have expanded and uh, I'm a fan of the Ashton product myself. Yeah. And Avo, was that another? Yes. Brand? Yeah. Yeah. David Off, but those were overpriced, I think. Yeah, I've never been a big fan uh, of that. Fancy, but fancy thing, yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. But it was fun. I mean, I used to be into all that, that kind of stuff. But it's, uh, you know, I just like I like I said, I go away, and and if like if you and I were away, if I could smoke and have a day in between going home, my wife wouldn't make me sleep in the backyard because she hates gotcha. it, hates the smell. Um, you know, her mom died of smoking and everything, so not. Uh, cigars, as my mother would but... tell, as my mother would tell me, everything in moderation. Yeah, right. Of course, that's what my grandmother always used to say. Right, I'm I'm still working on that on a few things. But. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, so what's well? No, there's something I was going to say before, and that is, you're you know, you're a sales guy. So, being out on your own and stuff like that's the always the intimidating part, having to sell and do things. And I think if you have that skill, you know, the rest of it you can learn and and spend time doing. It. It's not so daunting right. when well, when you have that background. You know, it's a social product. Uh, it's a it's just it's a social business, and it's the idea. It's kind of cut and dry. Either you want, you want me or you don't want me. Right. You know, some someone, people don't like the business, and some people do. Right. You know, you can get uh, people, a couple can get married without having a cigar roller. I'm the I'm the cherry on the cake. Right. But as I explain to people, is that they'll remember the bride, they may remember the band and the venue, but they're going to remember that cigar roller. 
Oh, yeah. I've never seen a cigar roller at a wedding. I wish I knew you. Well, you weren't in the business then 20 years ago, 22 years ago, something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, it adds a, a, a little special aspect to an event. Yeah. So, so what's going on in the cigar business right now is, is, are things closed? Has coronavirus affected it? Um, all, all of the cigar lounges are closed. Yeah. Um, um, where I get my product from or where other people get product from, it is a little challenging because everybody, no matter in the country or out of the country, has been shut down at one time or another. Uh, prices have gone up a bit. Um, and, you know, we're kind of feeling through exactly, you know, the same thing of where you can smoke and where you can be. And Yeah, because you got to be um, outside. It's going to be cold soon, right? Exactly. And, um, you know, the few events that I have done, um, I've had to, you know, make sure of social distancing. Uh, beforehand, not as much, but every cigar is individually uh, wrapped in cellophane. Uh, distancing. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah you know, it's a new world. Right. So. I assume the JNR giant humidor that you walk into is not open, right? Um, if it's just started, the humidor itself might be open and they, they would have limited people there, but right. I'm sure their smoking lounge is not open and I'm sure their restaurant isn't. Right. Yeah, no, I'm sure so. it's, I'm sure it's not. So let's talk about the business though a little bit, because sure. are there Amer American cigar manufacturers that manufacture in the United States? Or are they all like in Latin America? Well, there, there is a, a tobacco farm, uh, still in Tampa. They're the last. Okay. And uh, qu they are quite challenged before the uh, virus came about as far as cost, as far as um, legislation. The problem with cigars is that our, um, our federal government groups them in with uh, vaping, to do, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. And uh, they wanted well, to increase. Before vapes, what were they grouped with? <laughs> Um, we were pretty much left alone. Oh, so it's just its own category, and then they added vapes into that category. Well, why would they do that? What does that have to do with cigars? Well, that's what, you know, our, you know, organizations have been talking about. Yeah. And they wanted to raise the price of every cigar to $10, thinking that that would stop kids from smoking cigars. Um, I can't say that. A there lot of kids smoking any, cigars. That's my point. I'm not saying yeah. that they that they're smoking cigars, but um, when it, it becomes a political hot potato every once in a while, yeah, uh, yeah. and so that seems to be coming up. But so far, we've got excluded from that. Plus, they wanted to put a big levy on any manufacturer who wanted to introduce a new cigar into the country, to the point where it was like a quarter. You wouldn't of do it. Yeah. That you wouldn't even bother doing it. I don't exactly. even understand that. Look, I understand that smoking and, you know, smoke in your lungs and whatever, like you said, in moderation, whatever, but it's not even close to vaping. I mean, vaping, you're like taking food additives and breathing them in. We don't breathe in meat and chicken. Right. It's totally different. Oils and things like that. God knows what these kids, that's probably a whole nother show, what these kids are going to be Artificial suffering. Artificial flavoring. You know, yeah, like all that stuff. And they're breathing it in and they're going to have problems maybe even exactly. down the road and when they're older. That's right. You know, issues. And, you know, that's not cigar smoking. It's just not, you know, there's not, you know. You know, the premium cigar market is, is totally different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it kind of goes hand in hand with like the cognac and the high end bourbon market, right? I mean, guys that smoke cigars, maybe that's what got me into bourbon too. I don't know. <laughs> um, um, I love bourbon. I, I follow all the craft bourbons. I, so that's one of my bucket listings. I want to go on the bourbon trail. Ah, in, okay. Uh, well, you can't go on the cigar trail. I mean, is there like no. a place to go? No, they're all over the place. Well, you know, manufacturing wise, when you do, let's say, go to Dominican Republic or when you could, or could go to Cuba, you'd go to the factories. Right. But uh, that's been scaled back as well. Um, but pretty much, you know, you walk into a nice humidor and just inhale. Yeah, it's the same. Thing. When we were in um, Dominican Republic, what's that golf course? resort um teeth of the dog the, mm -hmm. the the golf course so we went to some place i forget the name altos chavon or something like that this town and there were all these cigar rollers they would have 
you know, I guess that's all these guys did. Like they have these tables all over with cigars while you're walking through the town right. and you just buy them. They're all, I guess you don't know what it's in them, but they're probably tobacco. I don't think they were laced or anything, but it was good. Cause they, first of all, they were cheap. Right. You know, right. and they're all, and there's no, there's no um, labels on them. You can't get any fresher than that. Yeah. And they weren't even in cellophane. They're just piled up. Like, Oh yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what the, so that's the same thing you're doing, right? Then at an event? Correct. Exactly. Wow. I'm going to have to let's go smoke a cigar, I think, after this. <laughs> We're talking about it. So let's also talk about how you run your business because this is an oh. entrepreneurial podcast and you're doing a lot of networking. You do networking events, which hopefully right. people will be able to attend again in person at some point. That's it kind of takes it away from the whole cigar thing when you have to do it virtually. Correct. You know, I attended a beer thing the other night. Everybody had their beer online. It was like kind of funny. <laughs> the guys are showing different beers and yeah. And, and a whiskey one too. There was a spirits uh, guy in Newark. He's got a distillery. Uh-huh. Right. And he took people through the distillers at the Cornell Club. And it, actually that was a good one because you know what they did? You probably could do this. You sign up and then they sent like two half bottles of whiskey from the distillery. Right. So you had right. it ahead of time. Right. Along with a couple of recipes, they told you what to have out in your kitchen, rocks, glass, and a lemon and different things, simple sugar. And we made some drinks and we talked about the history of, of stuff. So maybe you could do the same thing where they buy like a, you know, a four pack of something or other, a sampler, I don't know. And then they ship it ahead of time. They pay 80 bucks for the event or something like that. And then, I mean, I don't know if the spouses will be too happy, but if they could be outside, there you go. taste and practice, right? Exactly. Exactly. Just a thought. So let's talk about your business, how you run your business and the networking you're doing and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, I don't have a retail store. So all my retail sales are online. Uh, Obviously, I have a website. Right. Uh, On there, you could I have a full retail store with all my products. You can see some accessories that I offer. Okay. As well as some of the custom labeling that I've already done. Good. So we'll, Uh, we'll put the link in the show notes to your website. Thank you. Okay. Uh, as far as um, mainly about custom labeling or about rolling events, um, I've been a member of different types of uh, chambers, event planners. Um, I get recommended a lot, I'm happy to say. And I also um, have communications with people. When I was able to go out, I would uh, uh, visit private country clubs. I sell my cigars to private country clubs as well as liquor stores also. Yeah, because they want to have a supply. Exactly. I sell them to five states right now, including New Jersey. I like to expand that. Um, Unfortunately, social media won't allow me to advertise because it's a uh, tobacco product. Oh, they won't do like liquor and tobacco? They won't? uh, Liquor, you might be able to try to figure yourself around that, but um, I cannot boost or or buy advertising space on um, any type of uh, social media. I get a tremendous amount of leads uh, from Google. Uh, I'm listed on the first page for Cigar Roller of New- in New Jersey and Custom Labels in New Jersey. So I probably get about 75% of my leads from there. And From the uh, internet? Yeah, from the internet. And um, then I get calls from venues um, in uh, New Jersey, New York, uh, Connecticut, and into uh, Pennsylvania. So through uh, the internet, but a lot of it's networking too, right? With a lot of it's networking. A lot of it is uh, referral or follow-ups or outreach or um, you have to stay active. You have to keep your name out in front of people. Like I said, uh, competition isn't fierce. There's probably about three or four others who do what I do. Right. Uh, I would say I probably fall in the middle of that as far as activity goes. Uh, before this, I was doing about a hundred rolling events a year. Uh, oh, that's a lot. Well, if you condense it into the active season, which is probably April through November, uh, it's even a little bit more, correct. Yeah. Um, uh, That's like 10 you're doing. So that's like how many, 100 you said? Yeah, about 109 months. So that's like 10, 11 a month. That's a lot. You're busy. And uh, it's good to be busy. And now uh, between uh, golf outings or weddings, you know, people are getting married on Thursdays, obviously Friday, Saturday, Sundays, a lot of golf outings on Mondays because that's when private country clubs are closed right. and other people could rent the club for the day. 
Right. Um, so it's, um, so there's business going on right now because I know people are getting out on the course again, right? Things are starting to get uh, more active. There's right. definitely a lot more custom labeling. So that way they're giving them out because it's cutting down some expense about not having a cigar roller. I also do cigar bars where uh, you do the custom labeling, you set them up. They have two, three, four different types of cigars. And it's already ahead of time. Correct. Okay. And when I'll ship something like that out, I ship them out. You know, the cigars, I ship out a cutter or two, I ship out matches. So they just have to lay the cigars out and they're ready to go. They don't have to first supply things. But those, you're not rolling. No, no cigar bars, I don't roll. You have when a manufacturer. Well, um, I inventory anywhere between two and 5,000 cigars at a time. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was going to ask you. You you have a warehouse where you inventory this stuff? Um, I have two uh, tower humidors that will hold 2,500 cigars each. And, okay. Um, I'd rather have the inventory in my possession than have to wait for somebody to ship it to me. So, uh, I was going to ask you about the logistics of that stuff. So when people order through your website, you have to you fill the orders yourself? That's correct. So you got to wrap them up and you got to ship it a certain way, right? Because it's going to dry out if you don't. Well, they're shipped in plastic bags. They're either well cushioned with newspaper or bubble wrap to make sure that they get there safely. Okay. And yeah, and you know, instruction, first off, anytime I'll ship that, I supply what they call a shelf talker that gives you the description of the cigars. So that the way when they lay it out, people know what they're taking. Uh, also, okay instructions about how to maintain them till they use them. The idea, people think you put cigars in the refrigerator, which is just the wor worst thing you could do. Okay. Normally, That's if important. you're only having them for a few days, you leave them in the plastic bags that I shipped to you and you keep them at room temperature. Okay. If what you're going to keep- the fridge do? No, I'm not saying I do that. So <laughs> but what does the no. fridge do to the cigars? Well, it's going to harden it for one. Okay, uh, sure. Humidor temperature is anywhere between 68 and 75 degrees. Right, so which isn't even close to the refrigerator. The fridge is like 30-something, right? 38, 40. Exactly. And yeah. once you crack the tobacco on the outer leaf of the cigar, you can just throw the cigar away. It's just done. It? Yeah, because even if you brought it back, it would chip away as you started to smoke it. And to keep the cigars for a little bit more than two or three days, I suggest you take a piece of paper towel and you dampen it. You put it inside the paper, ba the plastic bag, but you keep it away from the cigars and you seal it and that moisture will keep the cigar fresh for about 10 days. Okay. But anything beyond that, you really need a humidor. Yeah. Yeah. And people that are buying for a situation, I kind of time it well enough where they have it well enough in advance, but they don't have it long enough to have that kind of any type of issue. Right. A couple of days. Exactly. They get in. Right. Exactly. Because you don't necessarily go to the event if you're providing... If I'm just sending cigars, I don't go to the event. Right. You don't need to be to set up the cigar bar. No. That's crazy. So tell me about, can we talk about like the, the uh, financials of the business, like the mechanics, sure. what's the pricing of it and things like that? Because you said that they were going to tax cigars and make them $10 a piece or something. Yeah. It ends up being crazy. You know, some people will go, well, you know, I want name brand cigars. Well, when you start getting into name brand cigars, even at $10 a stick and you want a hundred, are you ready to pay for a thousand dollars worth of cigars? Most of the time, not. Right. People who come to events, they could be smokers, but you know they're there to enjoy the smoke for that occasion. So, uh, as I said, I get product from boutique manufacturers, which brings my cost down. Uh, my costing structure is pretty simple. It's um, how long do you want me there for, and right. how many pre-rolled cigars do you want? So okay. if you want me there for an hour and I'm rolling 10 cigars, I'm bringing another 40 pre-roll, which will be a choice of two. Um, the cost range is about $540. Including the, your time? My time. And the cigars. And the cigars. And I always come with uh, cutters, matches, and plastic bags. Because somebody may want a cigar for Uncle Joe. Yeah. So we put it in a bag. That way it keeps it fresh. And uh, it bothers me when someone takes a cigar, sticks it in their pocket, and they end up chipping the end of the cigar. So I put it in a bag to protect it. Well, oh, that's the, the hand-rolled ones, because the other ones that's are in, cool. in, plant, in cellophane. It, now they're all in cellophane. Beforehand, I didn't. And that way people were able to touch it, feel yeah, it, smell, smell it. Smell it, yeah. it's nice. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, exactly. that's because of coronavirus, you mean? Yeah, I'm trying to give people a little bit of comfort. 
Right. Uh, I used to roll the cigars, let's say, a week in advance. Now it's more like 10 days in advance. So that way, in case anybody has any ill feeling about that, they know that it's... You'll know that it hasn't been touched for 10 days. Exactly. So where are your... You said you deal with some boutique manufacturers. Where are they located? Uh, one is in New Jersey and another one is in Florida. The one in Florida has outstanding product. It's a uh, Connecticut wrapper and a Maduro wrapper but it's 100% Cuban seed filler and it's grown in Dominican Republic. And um, I, ha I don't make it, I buy it and supply it, but I have to say it's delicious cigars. So wait a second, you said that the, that the Tampa was the last place that they had. Correct. So where does the Connecticut leaf fit in? Well, Connecticut, Connecticut wrapper is still being grown at a few farms in Connecticut. Okay. A lot of those farms have sold off because the property is worth a lot more than what they could do with tobacco. But Connecticut wrapper, cigar, Connecticut tobacco started in Connecticut. I can't tell you how many people I run into our age who tell me what told me when they lived in Connecticut, they worked on a tobacco farm. Oh, it was a big industry there. Big industry. And it was a place for them to get some work. Right, right. So, so if it's, if it's Cuban seed, so mm -hmm. they're so they're planting the Cuban seed in Dominican. Correct. Okay, and that and I guess just like wine or something changes the flavor or the strength or whatever because they're it's different soil. Well, there has to the be same? something. There has no. And anyone who says it does is not really saying telling the truth. There oh, is something I mean, about cigars from Cuba are majorly strong. I've had there. It's a different experience. Well, it has to do with the soil and it has to do with the climate. Okay. But like, but like any cigar, you can, you can get a more mild Cuban cigar or you get a much stronger one. You know, it, it just all depends on the different products. Uh, but Nicaraguan and Dominican are uh, making some excellent products now. Yeah. Because what's the, um, what's the cigar that's like really well known out of Cuba? Uh, Cohiba. Right. Right. right very commercial they i don't they have like a dominican or a, a Nicaraguan? Yeah, well all, all of them do monte cristo does romeo and juliet does i personally find monte i personally find the cohiba cuban cigars to be too strong for me yeah um but then the romeo and juliet is a much milder product and uh, the monte cristo kind of falls in between the two so but, so they yeah. have grow places and manufacturing places in all those islands yes yeah. Yes. Well, it makes sense. You can't ship from Cuba for years. So exactly. You want to sell to the United States. Right. So they made copies of it and came close and this is what they have. Yeah, exactly. So what is your uh, outlook on the industry? Is it, is it up now because of, I mean, you know, is it really hurt because of coronavirus? Um, the, in, the industry is hurt, but yeah. you know, hospitality in general has been hurt. Right. That's uh, true. Online Point. sales are stronger now for obvious oh, yeah. reasons. People are smoking at home. Right. Yeah. Um, people are looking. For You've seen that, that you got a lot of big oh, uptick on your website. Yeah, definitely. No question okay. about it. And um, the, the uptick on custom labeling, because people are looking for something different and if they have a party, they want to celebrate. Right. Um, bits and pieces as far as the uh, rolling events happening live. Uh, I do have a few coming up now. Oh, you but do. I'm, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing a uh, golf outing on Tuesday. I uh, have three or four in October, and um, I'm, I am getting booked for, uh, for the second half of 2021. So, so next fall? Uh, next summer, next fall, yes. But not in the spring? Um, that may come as time goes on. You know, it, it all depends on how people feel. Uh, in our state, uh, they intend on increasing um, from 25 to 50% uh, indoor occupancy at restaurants so that may change um you know people doing events but generally speaking all these venues have uh, pretty much been shut down yeah no it's killing them it really is killing them so if you're at an event you got to wear a mask you think um i wear a mask uh i won't do it without it um okay. i purchased a u-shaped um uh plastic um shield that i put in front of me and, oh, well, uh, I see. So the people can, because they want to watch you. Well, they want to see. Yeah. But I want to be protected. Yeah, you don't want to breathe and, on you. 
and then the uh, pre-rolled cigars are put on a separate table so people can just go go up and help themselves. Right, I got it. Okay, yeah, I, I don't know. You you know you don't think about all these things, but if you're in the hospitality business, people are around you. There's spit flying everywhere. You don't even know. Yeah, right. Yeah. So you exactly the yourself. case. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to hear though, that things are starting to starting to loosen up, and you know. Yeah, there's definitely an uptick. There's definitely more inquiries about uh, future events. Yeah. How does, uh, was cigars a big part of your life when you were young? Like, is that your family's like um, supportive of your well hobby um, habit business career? My, my father was a smoker. <laughs> Both my parents died many years ago. Um, my, my family your father was a cigar smoker. No, he was a cigarette smoker. Yeah. Most of these people, yeah. Older generation. Yeah. He was smoking, smoke, yeah. he was smoking, uh, three packs a day. Yeah. So, uh, we, we family members knew what the outcome was going to be. Right. So it's a little strange that I entered into this business, but, um, again, talking about moderation, I don't have a storefront. So I smoke two to three cigars a month at most. Oh, that's all you do, uh, huh? Well, you know, you know, long term, smoking a lot of anything probably isn't good. Yeah, you're supposed to put air in your lungs. That's about it. Yeah. Exactly. But in yeah. turn, um, it's a good feeling. I could say if I don't smoke for three weeks, it's not like I miss it. It's not like I'm right. free. Yeah, I didn't it. miss it. I used to um, smoke, you know, not one a day, but a couple of weeks, I think, I was smoking. And the idea know, is, is that I personally want to have time to enjoy it. You know, there's very few uh, chain smoking cigar smokers. Right. You know, it's on the golf course. It's in the backyard with a right. glass of wine, a beer, or scotch. Um, so um, my family's, in, you know, in favor of what I'm doing. They know I like what I'm doing. And as I said, it's a social type of thing. Right. And, um, you know, it's for good occasions. Yeah. So yeah, like right. Usually think, it is celebratory type of things. Yeah, I like to think I'm bringing a little happiness or a little yeah. love. That's a, unlike cigarettes. Nobody says, yeah, we had a baby. Let's bring out a pack of cigarettes, you know. <laughs> you know, it's funny. I think the only guys that do chain smoking cigars are the ones that their doctor told them they have to stop smoking cigarettes. And they get those little, what are they called, cigarillos or something? Yes, yes. And yeah. they suck those things down. And I'm like, well, that's not good for you either. I, you know, I don't understand that. And occasionally someone will come up and say, gee, I like that cigar. I used to be a cigar smoke, uh, cigarette smoker, but I quit. And I discourage them from lighting it up. Yeah, because they just fall back to, yeah, it's, yeah they were listen, addicted. Listen, you're hurting yourself. Yeah. And th exactly. there's, there's, there's no reason for that. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing addicting about cigars. It doesn't have something built into it that make you want to smoke more. It's tobacco with tobacco. Right. You know, th that's what's there on it. Yeah, so. it's some chemical that makes you, I mean, that's brilliant, right? Let's, uh, let's make a product. Let's put a drug in it that drugs people into wanting more. Right. There you go. But, and they got away cigars. with, they got away with that for 40 or 50 years. So, yeah, well, I mean, that's the problem with cigars, right? It kind of, it, it's been grouped into that truth.com thing with all the federal legislation, right? They are just smoking. That's right. And they don't give it any kind of, and, and I agree with you. I don't think people should be smoking, you know, 24 hours a day either, but, I mean, you know, prohibition didn't go too well either. We got back to that. And then people saying you shouldn't drink every day. And there's people right. that do. But, you know, right. you still can enjoy a bourbon or a cognac or something like that. So now when you do events, do you ever have uh, – you do like co-branded events like with, like with a guy who's got a distillery or, you know, stuff like that? I do that. And I do also work with the two largest um, liquor distributors in the state. Oh, Okay. And so they distribute at, everything, right? They distribute everything. And in fact, one of the first events I did with one of the distributors, it was at the W Hotel in, uh, in, um, geez, in Hoboken. Yeah, right by the right, water there. Right by the water. And that's when they were introducing those uh, mini vehicles. And they, uh -huh. had them, they had about a dozen of them lined up on the water. So uh, pretty hotel, nice space, and it, it was very good. And any, a lot of times when they'll uh, introduce a new liquor or even a new wine, they'll want to pair it uh, with a cigar event. Yeah, right. So you've so you've been to some of these whiskey fests and things like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. There's one in the city. I forget. I think at the Mario Marquis. That's nuts. And I know there's a lot of cigar people there too. Well, I um, they haven't had it. I'm sure this year, or maybe even last year. Well, cigar aficionado has a sister magazine 
where um, that's when they do a lot of their uh, whiskey tasting. In fact, they call it Whiskey Fest, maybe. I think yeah. that's it. There was one in Jersey yeah. City I went to called Whiskey Fest. That was mm-hmm. the funny thing is you can't buy anything there. Right. I that's guess right. you could buy a cigar, but you can't buy liquor. Yeah, I, I think they're prohibited from selling. Yeah, they just they don't have a license to do it, I don't think, in an right. event like that. But you get a little glass and you have 40 shots for the night and you're a wreck. And, and you're feeling good. Yeah, very good. I still, <laughs> <laughs> I still have, you know, it's funny, it's a little bit off the topic, but so I, my cousin, he drinks bourbon too. We got, we got um, obsessed with making clear ice. You know, when you go to a bar, even a cigar bar, right? You get a bourbon or you get a, a, a scotch and they, they have this really nice ice that's clear and square. Right. And they pour it over, whatever. And then you're having your cigar, you're sitting there, whatever. So you can't just like make ice in your fridge and have it be clear. Right. There's a whole science to it because no matter what you freeze, there's always air that gets trapped. So we've been figuring out you take this cooler, you do it, you cut it up with a bread knife. So I'm on with the guy from Newark, the distillery. Um, it's called All All Points Distillery. Uh-huh. Maybe, actually, maybe at some point you could do a like a joint event with him because he's in Newark in the Ironbound section. Cool. Um, I can introduce you to him. I'm trying to get him on my podcast. But he, so he did, the, he had this clear eye. So I said to him, Oh, that's hard to do. How did you get that? He goes, Oh, I bought this kit on Amazon. He shows me. That's funny. 35 bucks. I get the thing. And yeah, it's this big brick. And then you put the water in and then it drops down while it's freezing. And then you have to take it out, but it works. That's so now I, that's my, I've solved that problem. I called my cousin. I was all excited. I said, we got clear ice. <laughs> go, what are you more excited about than I am? I go, well, you got um, it me just means you need to drink more with that clear ice. That's for sure. But I miss the days of having a, a humidor um, and all the, I probably spent too much money on cigars. So it didn't matter. But so, so are you a, um, like a torpedo guy or you like smaller cigars? Or I used to, cigars? I used to like torpedoes only. And now uh, I've kind of moved a little bit more to the Robusto, the round edges. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm more of a mild to mild to medium cigar smoker, but for a little while I've been smoking these um, Nicaraguan cigarellos. Okay. And, so they're um, small. They're small. Um, which is better in general, right? But, um, just, just a very nice uh, cigar. In fact, when it's over, it's kind of like I'm missing a little bit more. I wish it was a little longer. <laughs> and those are all private label stuff. You don't smoke. Generally. Um, that it, that in particular is um, is a uh, is a, is another manufacturer's uh, cigar. But um, but is it available on your website? Yes. Oh, yeah. okay, good. Anything yeah. you smoke is available on your website. That's correct. I okay. smoke my yeah. own stuff and I recommend my own product. Yeah, I would hope so. It would be crazy if you said, yeah, buy my cigars. I don't, I don't smoke that. I smoke this. Well, good or bad, whatever I offer is something that I enjoy. Yeah, of course. And it gives, it, me the com- it gives me the confidence to uh, you know, make the recommendations. I feel good about it. Right, of course. I mean, look, if you had a retail store and you had you know, 50, 80 types of cigars obviously not going to smoke them all but right if you're doing custom stuff so it's what is it maximcigars.com is your website correct m-a-x-u-m cigars i actually named it after my son max and uh that's where it all came from yeah because maxim i think is like a magazine or something right well that would be m-a-x-i-m right so i wasn't looking for any additional trouble so i went with (laughs) m-a-x-u-m yeah. Is that a trademark? You've trademarked Maxim Cigars? Yes. yes, I have. Okay. All rights reserved. Exactly. Very good. Rob, I appreciate you coming on. Um, it's uh, getting to be four o'clock and I got another guy. I got to do some things before the Jewish holiday starts. So ah, yes. I, I appreciate it. I know that I think there's, we have a meeting next week or something. Yes. We have a meeting on the 30th, which is a Wednesday. Yes. And I will not be there. I'm... It's my wife's birthday. So I take ah, the well, day off. Happy birthday. Yeah. Smart, that's my gift man. to her. Yeah, I, I made it Smart a habit man. over the years to just take the day off. And although the ironic thing, I do have like one meeting in the morning and she's going to get her nails done. But then, you know, we spend well, the day perfect. together. We go get dinner and lunch Very and nice. do some shopping. It's just a nice day. But Very I guess we good. can't do as much as we used to be because things are going to be a little tight in terms of getting to stores. And I don't know if we want to go to stores, you know? Yeah, you know, it, it, you have to feel comfortable about something like that. So yeah. do, you, do you cook holiday dinner or does your wife? No, I'm not a cook. I'm, I'm not, I'm a terrible, terrible cook. I burn things. I'm good at that. I'm just, I mean, I help. I, I do dishes. I do garbage. I do all that stuff. I don't let her do any of it, 
Um, although the holidays, usually there's cousins there, whatever, they'll do it, whatever. Right. But right. for general dinner, she's a big cook and I'm a big cleaner. Well, Leah, for Rosh Hashanah, I found a new recipe for uh, Simis in the yeah. New York Times. That's the yams one thing? Right? That's sweet potato, pota potato and carrots. Oh, okay. And uh, I got my original recipe from my mother, but I, I was getting a little bored and I tried something else and it worked out pretty good. So, All right. Uh, Email it to me. I will. It, I'll give it to it, my wife. Actually, so you simple. know what? We were trying to do holiday dinner, uh, you know, breakfast on Monday. Um, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fade this out anyway. 